Okay, so let's begin talking about early astronomy. This is a great way to introduce uh, astronomy and all astronomy encompasses and some of the early thoughts that brought astronomy into the mainstream as a science. We go back to the ancients uh, and the ancient peoples and how they used astronomy. We'll talk about the Greek culture. Specifically, they were very influential. And we'll look at kind of a turning point in astronomy with Nicholas Copernicus in the 1500s. We'll look at Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, which were two major players that um, brought astronomy into the modern age. Uh, Galileo as well. Galileo and Newton are, are also um, important figures in that. So let's begin with the ancients, starting from the beginning. Many ancient civilizations used astronomy uh, for their daily lives. The Egyptians, for example, would wait for the rising of the dog star, which is called Sirius. It's the brightest star in the sky. It's part of the constellation of uh, Canis Major, the big dog. Uh, it's actually Orion the hunter's dog. But when Sirius began to rise, um, they knew that it was time to plant crops. And so all along the Nile River Valley, uh, much of astronomy was used for agriculture. So down in this area here. Uh, additionally, then, the Mesopotamians uh, in the Tigris and Eura Euphrates River Valleys uh, used uh, astronomy for um, keeping time. Um, also, the, the, the Mesopotamian society, particularly the Babylonians, but also Sumerians there, um, were prominent thinkers, as well as the, you know, the Greeks at the time. They are responsible for this, uh, our circle geometry, our 360-degree circle, and the idea of pi uh, to describe the um, circumference of a circle, um, etc. So lots of good contributions there. Uh, the Chinese are known for their great records. Uh, they kept records of eclipses and, and uh, meteor showers, comets. They even kept records of a supernovae. It's thought that um, the crab uh, supernova occurred in 1054 AD and uh, that the Chinese are the ones that um, were able to see it and record it and they have good records of it um, appearing in the sky as a bright um, guest star, uh, uh, quote unquote, uh, very bright in the night sky for several uh, days, up to a month, I think. Um, so they have good records of that. Uh, also then, uh, they're they are prominent in, in calendars and creating calendars. Uh, the mess, uh, oh yeah, okay, there we go. And then we have um, the Mesoamericans, which are the Mayans and the Aztecs. Uh, this area here, so the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Andean region, the Incas, they all used astronomy for their purposes as well. Um, they recorded eclipses and used some of the uh, astronomical phenomenon uh, as part of their kind of meet, uh, meaningful ceremonies, etc. And then you've all seen Moana. Uh, the Polynesians used astronomy for navigation. Uh, so that would be all the region, regions uh, around the Pacific Rim here. The Greeks, though, they were a very prominent civilization, um, studying astronomy all the way back uh, to you know, 600 BC or so. He, uh, Aristotle was one particularly influential Greek. In fact, he's known as the father of the geocentric theory. And what that means is that um, when looking at the universe and how it's structured, Earth is the center. Now, this made a lot of sense for people at the time because when you actually look up in the sky, you see things rising in the east and setting in the west. It looks like everything's revolving around the earth. And so it, it kind of makes sense at first glance to say, hey, yeah, that's, the earth is the center of the universe. Um, and so the moon revolves around the earth, Venus, the sun, Mars, you know, the other visible planets at the time were uh, Mercury, and then also Saturn and Jupiter. Um, so they would all revolve, and as well as well as the stars. So here's a look at what Aristotle's model might look like here, in the bottom left, and it's at his actual model is in the bottom right um, that he proposed. And so Aristotle, very influential. He also had proofs that the Earth was a sphere that. Um, there, there was a force called gravity interacting with everything. Um, so very influential. Unfortunately, this is wrong, right? Uh, but because he was so influential, his ideas lasted probably for 1,500 years before they were um, thought through and um, kind of uh, replaced. 
There was a contemporary at the time of Aristotle, that person's name was Aristarchus. And Aristarchus, uh, circa 300 BC, also studied uh, the uh, makeup of the universe and came up with a heliocentric solar system. And that is where the sun is the center of all motion in the solar system. Uh, you can see Aristarchus's model uh, in the bottom right. And as you can see, at 300 BC, he nailed it. He got it all right. He actually, what he did was he used geometry um, with the moon and the sun and the earth to d and phases of the moon and also uh, the size of the shadows of the eclipses in order to tell pretty accurately how far relatively the earth was from the sun and the moon and how big each of them were um, based on the shadow angles and the shadow sizes of phases and eclipses. So pretty ingenious use of geometry to nail it at 300 BC. Unfortunately, Aristotle was very much more influential than Aristarchus. And so Aristotle's ideas were the ones that lasted uh, through the time. Uh, about um, the 150s AD now, uh, one other prominent Greek, Ptolemy, tried to use uh, some pretty sophisticated modeling to explain the motions of the planets. The word planet in Greek is planetes, which means wanderers. So the planets actually, what they would do is they would travel eastward against the background of the stars each night. And uh, so they'd go from here to uh, let's see if I can write on here, from here to here and here to here. Each night they go a little bit further eastward. And so if you go out the same time every night, this is what you would see. And then what they do is they track and they do this little westward loop. It's called retrograde motion. And then what they do is start going prograde again. Prograde motion is that eastward motion. Uh, retrograde was that backwards westward motion. And so because of this motion, it played with the minds of the ancients. They couldn't explain it. Um, how do you explain a planet going backwards in the sky uh, from its normal path, uh, that retrograde motion? And so Ptolemy tried to put it together. And so what he did was he put the planet on a so-called epicycle. So what he did was the, it was still a geocentric model, but he put the Earth on one uh, uh, side of the um, of the center of the, the orbits of the other planets. And he, he put a sort of equin on the other. So he was starting to get it right that the planet's orbits are slightly elliptical, but he still used circles, right? And so in order to make this geometry work, what he did is he made these so-called epicycles. And epicycles are basically bicycle wheels on bicycle wheels. So you have the motion of this orbit going around and around, but then you've got this little epicycle uh, taking the planet in a circle. And what it does is it makes the planet go through a loop-de-loop -loop around the Earth. And when it does that, it, it explains the retrograde motion. Now, obviously, this is a lot of mental gymnastics here. You, um, it, it really requires a lot of assumptions to, to, to um, say that a planet does a loop-de-loop -loop in orbit, right? Uh, so, but it was kind of the best explanation at the time. And his model was pretty prolific as well with these so-called epicycles, circular orbits on circular orbits. It wasn't until the 1500s that we kind of worked out. Um, Nicholas Copernicus, uh, between early 1500s and mid 1500s, uh, proposed, reproposed the heliocentric idea that the sun is the center of all motion in the solar system. Um, <clears throat> He proposed that because of the Earth's rotation, that the Earth rotated in orbit as it orbited the sun, and this is what caused the rising and setting, and that, of course, is correct. It's also correct that the sun is in the center, but Copernicus actually still held on to those epicycles to explain the retrograde motion. So he nailed it mostly, uh, but he still had those epicycles, right, uh, to describe that retrograde motion. Uh, but he got everybody back on the right track. Um, at this time, uh, science was kind of, quote unquote, being uh, created, um, that the idea that you can draw logical conclusions based on data, logical and reasonable conclusions based on data gathered. And this is the essence of the scientific method and what science is. Uh, so you really can't claim anything further than data can explain. Uh, but models are a good use at, at the time and so forth uh, to try to put things together. So things started advancing. 
And uh, thanks to some amazing observations from Tycho Bray and the amazing analysis of Johannes Kepler, we brought astronomy into the mainstream. So Tycho Bray was a Danish nobleman. He was from the, he was appointed by the King of Denmark as a state astronomer, and the King of Denmark afforded him an, a whole island. And this island Tycho Bray used to uh, build a big observatory, and. At the time, science, uh, they had like these little handheld devices that they used in order to calculate the positions in the sky. Um, they were called equants. Um, you'll see pictures of them in the book. Um, but what Tycho Bray did is he built a building size version of that. So he took the handheld device and made a, a building size version. And because of that, he was able to get measurements. Because you expand out the measurement capabilities, measurements came into a 16th of a degree. This was unprecedented accuracy um, that he was able to map the sky in. And so when you get things, start getting things really nailed down to that really good, accurate um, uh, positions, uh, some things start to flush out. Tycho Bray noticed that comets actually don't orbit in circles. Up to this point, everybody thought it was all circles. Nope. Um, actually, they orbit in ellipses. <clears throat> uh, they have more of an elliptical orbit, a curving orbit that's not circular. Um, and he noticed this that Mars, um, he was able to track very accurately the, 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 um, the traverse of Mars in our sky. And so Tycho Bray uh, dies in six, six, basically 1601, and um, he had a mathematical assistant by the name of Johannes Kepler that took Tycho Bray's day and began analyzing it. And Kepler made very careful observations of all the planets, particularly focused in on Mars. And he explored with other geometric shapes for the orbit. Uh, typically, in the past, they used circles, but uh, Kepler uh, broke out of the norm and looked at the orbits as ellipses. And so you can see here the elliptical orbit in green. Uh, when exploring that, he noted that the planet's orbits are almost circular, but they're actually slightly elliptical. And if you make them slightly elliptical, it explains the retrograde motion uh, and explains all the data. So it was really profound uh, discovery. And um, thanks to the, the accurate uh, measurements of Tycho Bray, Kepler was able to do this. Now, aside from that, Kepler had this um, grand vision of the um, harmony of the uh, motions in the universe as being all mathematically calculable and all the the ge geometry working together in harmony. And so this harmonious uh, uh, idea of motions of, of the heavens, um, which was uh, very, very much philosophical as well. So from Kepler's observations, he came up with three laws. Now, I want to remind you here. Um, so here they are. He developed three laws of planetary motion. I want to focus in on this word for a second. Remember, laws, a scientific law is something that you can observe in nature, right? It's a natural observable. It's it's something that nature just does. Uh, now, we don't always know what nature does, and so it takes scientists to come along and observe nature and record it and, and describe it for everyone, and that's what a scientific law is. Okay, so this scientific law by Kepler, these scientific laws are basically just things that he observed about the motions of the planets that up to that point, no one had really realized. Uh, and that's what a scientific law is. And so uh, science operates in laws, which are natural observables. And science, science also operates in data and theories, and our data, hypotheses, and theories. Um, data and hypotheses are how you test um, ideas about the universe and theories are how you basically describe a set of laws. Okay. <clears throat> so we talked about that a little bit at the beginning of our course, but it's again, whenever you see that word law, it's, it's a good to highlight that. Here's Kepler's first law, first of three laws. It's basically that planets and satellites travel in ellipses. They're nearly circular in their orbit, but they are a little elliptical. All right. This is something that actually had to be defined and represented for people because up to that point it wasn't known. So planets and travel, uh, satellites travel in ellipses. So Kepler's first law then was about the shape of the orbit. When you have something travel in an ellipse, uh, you what you get is a point where the planet is closest to the sun, and that would be called perihelion. 
and you get a point when the planet is farthest from the sun, and you call that aphelion. Okay, the Earth at perihelion is about 147 million kilometers, and the Earth at aphelion is 152 million kilometers. Now we're going to revisit these these um, again, but you can notice that um, the close the time we're closest to the sun is on January 3rd, and the time we're farthest from the sun is on July 4th. And so we'll get in, dig into that a little bit later. Um, interesting uh, consequence there. But nonetheless, there's a closest point and a farthest point because the Earth orbits an ellipse. Kepler's second law is that is this. It's about orbital speed, okay? Where the first one was about orbital shape, orbital speed is the second one. It's basically that um, if you watch a planet moving from one point in its orbit to another point in its orbit over the course of 30 days, like a month, okay? When the planet's at, at perihelion, it's faster. It moves faster. And when a planet is at aphelion, if you measure 30 days, okay, uh, the planet moves slower in orbit. Okay, so Kepler's second law basically recognizes this, that uh, a planet will speed up near perihelion and slow down near aphelion. Now, this has gravitational and rotation, uh, uh, revolutionary um, uh, connections that we'll make when we talk about Newton. But um, as you can see here, uh, the planet um, at perihelion, it kind of like the planets move faster in their orbit here. They swing around faster. And when they get out to aphelion, they kind of like move fast and they start to slow down. And then they zip in again and slow down. Uh, and so Kepler's second law is about orbital speed, that a planet will sweep out equal areas in equal amounts of time. The 30-day period from here to here, if you actually make a pie slice with that, this area right here is actually the same as this area. Even though the planet is moving slow from here to here, this, these areas are equal. Okay, and so that's why they call this sometimes the law of equal areas. But um, Kepler's second law is about orbital speed. Okay, orbital speed. So if you're taking notes, you want to write Kepler's second law, orbital speed. A planet will speed up at perihelion and slow down at aphelion. <clears throat> we note that Kepler's first law was about orbital shape, remember? Planets and satellites orbit in ellipses. Because they orbit an ellipses, you're going to have a fastest point and a slowest point. Kepler's third law is that you can actually calculate the distance of, the, of any planet from the sun if you know how long it takes to get around the sun. That this, uh, and if you know how far a planet is away, you can predict uh, accurately using mathematics how long it's going to take to get around the sun. So the distance and orbit of a planet orbital period of a planet are related. And they're related by this equation here, p squared equals d cubed. Uh, the period of any planet squared is equal to its distance away from the sun cubed. And the period is in years, Earth years, and the distance is in AUs, or astronomical units. Okay, one astronomical unit uh, equals the, the average distance from the Earth to the sun. Okay, and that is uh, how you calculate this. So Kepler recognized that you can tell how fast a planet is orbiting if you know how far away it is, and vice versa. And when you plot this, this is the distance here on the uh, y-axis and the number of years on the x-axis. If you plot these things, all the planets fall right in line and uh, and relate to this equation. Even Pluto does this, even though it's not a planet, it's a dwarf planet. So um, there's something about distance and, and um, time of orbit that's mathematically related. So uh, Kepler, with this information, brings astronomy into the modern age that, okay, we actually know what the solar system is, is made up of and how it operates. And from that, it's you're able to uh, surmise lots of different great things. Now, Tycho Bray was operating in the late 1500s. Kepler was operating in the early 1600s. And the early to mid 1600s, we have Galileo. And Galileo's contribution was actually using a telescope 
in order to make important observations and discoveries about the, the solar system. This actually further he, um, uh, solidified the heliocentric model that, yeah, Kepler, you're right. Look, I'm Galileo, and I'm giving you telescope observations to, to prove that you're right. Okay, So here was Galileo's telescope discoveries. When he looked at the stars, there's still little dots through the telescope. Now, Galileo didn't invent the telescope. He's just the first to use it to extensively study astronomy. Stars are far away. They look like little dots, whether you look at them in the telescope or not. Um, he looked at the cloudy uh, band in the sky that we call the Milky Way now as part of like the Milky Way, the arms of the Milky Way galaxy, and noted that there are a bunch of stars, right? So stars are far away. That's actually kind of an important discovery. When he looked at the moons, he noted that it had mountains and valleys, that the moon actually has land features. So it's not just some foreign world, but it's actually a world that has... <clears throat> many features that are similar to Earth's. So it's uh, an important discovery because at that point they didn't know. When he studied the sun, he noted that the sun actually has these little dark areas called sunspots. And he was actually able to track the motion of the sunspots, noting that the sun actually um, rotated, right? That the sun actually had movement as well. He pointed the telescope at Jupiter and discovered four large moons orbiting Jupiter. And these are now actually called the Galilean moons. And lastly, when he pointed the telescope at Venus, he saw that it went through phases, that Venus must be close to the, closer to the sun than us, and it must be orbiting the sun because it goes through all the phases. So um, these are actually important discoveries because they helped uh, say, yes, world, the sun is the center. It's not the Earth that's the center. It's the it's the sun is that's the center of our solar system and the earth orbits around it so do the rest of the planets people and this actually launched us into the modern age of astronomy and then with all these other discoveries uh the world was opened up the world of astronomy is opened up oh i have little slides for each here stars are far away you can see a picture of the milky way galaxy that the sun has sunspots and these are actually uh Galileo's markings and, and sketches of the sunspot motion here. Here, sunspots. And this is the, the lunar surface. Um, Galileo was actually trained in art um, as part of his training. And so thanks to that, we have some, some great sketches of uh, some of the things that he went through and learned about. And then here's Jupiter's moons. He actually, when looking at the through the telescope, he was actually able to plot the little moon positions here as they moved around Jupiter night by night. And you can see how they, they look different um, each night. So he was able to note that, oh, not only is the Earth not the center of motion, but other planets have moons that orbit them also. And that Venus has phases, that it wouldn't make sense for Venus to go through phases unless it was between us and the sun and that it orbited the sun. So this actually helped further solidify the geocentric, or sorry, the heliocentric model, that the sun is the center. Okay. So Galileo's discoveries. Lastly today, uh, we have Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton was a pretty prominent scientist. He was actually um, a very brilliant and gifted scientist. Um, he worked out of Cambridge University in England. He was a very distinguished professor there. Um, during the bubonic plague, he took time off and spent time at his um, family's uh, farm. And it's noted that it's, you know, an apple fell and conked him on the head and he came up with the theory of gravity. Well, probably not. But uh, the, the idea that he actually learned about gravity and thought about gravity and studied it and noted that apples falling from trees, um, you know, uh, was the result of that um, kind of probably helped the process, right? Because of his study of forces in motion, was able to invent what we call calculus, and calculus is actually the um, the study of motion in three dimensions, right? So cal um, Galileo was able to, or, or sorry, Newton was able to describe that, and Newton was also able to uh, note that. Um, as a result of all the motions and forces, gravity uh, came into play. So Newton had three laws of motion, and his first law dealt with, uh, let's see here, I have a summary of these. 
So we're just going to go to the summary here in the interest of time. That um, Newton's first law is about movement. Uh, so Newton was basically describing movement. He came up with equations for velocity, which is speed and direction. He came up with uh, um, uh, equations for acceleration, which is the change in the speed and direction of an object. And he came up with inertia, that things just will, will um, remain in motion unless a force stops them. And so from that, he was able to flush out uh, friction, the force of friction. So Newton's first law was about movement. Newton's second law was about force. And um, he described the, the, that force is actually a mass accelerating, that um, a mass has to be moving to create a force. So force is about masses moving. And then the third law was about action and reaction, that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, a jet engine, for example, expels gas, uh, exploding gas backward, which pushes the engine forward. Um, and there's lots of different applications of Newton's laws. I have a little picture showing um, Newton's first law about movement, inertia here with the soccer ball. Um, if a soccer ball was kicked and it was moving along a frictionless uh, surface, it would actually move forever in that direction. So this is Newton's first law. Newton's second law, the law of force, that uh, a force is equal to mass times acceleration, that uh, a ball uh, at a certain mass would be accelerating, it would be actually creating a force. And a force actually created that, which brings us to a uh, third law, which is action and reaction, that if you have two people high-fiving on skateboards, they're gonna actually push each other backwards because for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction that uh, force is moving um, uh, were described there. So the bottom line here, folks, with Newton is that with his discoveries, he was actually able to uh, describe movement, he was able to describe forces, and he was able to describe forces interacting, what that actually did was it uh, explained gravity, that there is this centripetal force, that there is this uh, force responsible for all motion moving towards the center of the earth. And, and, and that motion would be what we call gravity, which is that centripetal force pulling everything to, to the center of the Earth. And you can actually calculate that force uh, using uh, the famous equation that Newton came up with. And this is the uh, gravity equation, the universal law of gravitation, they call it, where the force of gravity is uh, equal to uh, the two masses that you're calculating. Uh, divided by the distance between them, squared, and then they also he also threw what they call a universal gravitational constant. And so basically, um, you exert a force of gravity. The Earth, of course, exerts, exerts a force of gravity. Earth's gravity is king. That's why when you're walking around, like little particles don't orbit you, uh, because Earth's gravity is way stronger than the gravity you assert. But anything that has matter or that has mass, has gravity. Um, so remember that. You are gravitationally attractive, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> gravity also explains the orbits of the planets, and that's kind of like the uh, connection with Kepler, that as planets are orbiting, the thing that's causing them to orbit is the centripetal acceleration towards the sun, which we know of as gravity. And there's that famous equation there. So that's a quick look at the history of astronomy. Um, all the uh, stuff that we just went through with the ancients, uh, the Greeks and their contributions, Copernicus and, and Copernicus's contribution to astronomy, uh, Tycho Brahe and his accurate measurements, and Johannes Kepler, uh, as well as Galileo and his discoveries with the telescope and Newton and his discoveries with uh, motion actually brought astronomy from um, just a kind of a more of a um, pseudoscience into an actual science. And so from there, we have many discoveries that result.